A while back I stumbled across what has to be the world's most useless camera, this somewhat anonymous CGCM. OK, that might all be a bit of an exaggeration, but you'll see what I mean when I show what this camera can or can't do. The CGCM is a modified version of the Contax 137, probably the earlier MD version, which was introduced around 1980. By this stage, Contax cameras were being manufactured by Yashica. I've already done a video looking at my Yashica FR1, which is based upon the earlier Contax RTS, link in the description. From what I can find out, the CGCM was a custom build intended for use as an oscilloscope camera, or possibly a microscope camera, but I'm more inclined towards it being an oscilloscope camera. Not something I'd really thought about before, having only used modern digital oscilloscopes, whereby I can press a button to save the image to a memory stick. Whereas, in the past, the only way to record the waveform displayed on your oscilloscope was to take a photograph. Manufacturers would make a hinged hood with an attached camera that you'd swing into position over the CRT display when you needed to record the image. Some of these cameras shot onto regular film, which needed to be developed once the roll was full, while others had Polaroid cameras attached to the hood, giving you a more or less instant result. I've not yet found definitive proof that the CGCM was sold as an oscilloscope camera, such as a brochure showing the camera as an optional extra, but it does appear to be the most likely answer. I was intrigued to see what modifications had been done to the Contax 137. Was it simply a standard camera inside, with many of the controls blanked off so meddling fingers couldn't change the settings, rendering all the screenshots useless, or was it a bit more specialised? From what I've read, some of the CGCM cameras used a special lens unit with a leaf shutter inside, so all the camera body had to do was hold its own shutter open while the leaf shutter fired. Some models even had the mirror removed because the whole setup would be pre-focused when initially set up on the oscilloscope. Mine thankfully does have its mirror, otherwise it really would be useless. As far as controls go, we have the on-off switch with the shutter button in the middle. The shutter would be fired from the oscilloscope, or the hinged hood assembly, and you'd probably only use the shutter button when loading a new film. Behind that is the rewind release button, hidden beneath this lever. The frame counter is in this little window, and the exposure mode selector is blanked off, as is the hot shoe. The rewind crank is in the usual spot, but the film speed dial, along with the exposure compensation dial and the shutter mode switch, have been removed. On the front, the depth of field preview button is blanked off, but the lens release button above is still active. The flash sync socket is blanked off, and so is the remote release socket down at the bottom. On the underside, there's a blanking plug where the bottom release catch would sit. The 137 uses four AA batteries, which are housed beneath this bottom plate. The tripod socket is still present, then there's a 4-pin socket which would provide power and remote shutter firing for the CGCM. Some models of the CGCM that I've seen had different sockets on the bottom and presumably different modifications inside the camera. As with nearly all the Contax cameras of this generation, the luxurious body covering has deteriorated, leaving the whole thing looking a bit of a mess. My thoughts for this camera are that it would be nice to use the camera in some form or another, but not modify it in any way that prevents returning it to its original state. So job number one was to work out how to get inside. On the standard 137 you undo the release catch and the bottom hinges off, over a screw on the opposite side. I initially tried removing the screw, that gave me a little movement, but clearly it was being held at the other end. So I used a sheet of rubber as a friction tool, and eventually managed to release the blanked off catch. There were traces of glue holding this catch shut, so they really didn't want you getting inside. Once the bottom was off, it was immediately clear that this isn't just a standard camera with a few controls blanked off, because where the batteries should be is a dedicated circuit board, with a few logic chips and a random smattering of other components. I'll put a better shot on screen in case anyone wants to study it. 
I then removed the top cover, which is pretty standard stuff, and began to trace where the wires from the socket in the base are actually going. White goes to ground, and orange goes to the on-off switch, so those are likely to be power, and as they're unlikely to have modified everything about the camera, it will likely need 6 volts. The green wire goes to the shutter button, so that'll be the remote shutter release, and the brown wire appears to be linked to a switch that's triggered when the camera advances the film and the frame counter. So, after a bit more checking, I started carefully with something like 3 volts on my bench power supply and turned the camera on. Nothing. No illumination on the LED, and nothing if I pressed the shutter button. I gradually crept up to 6 volts, but still nothing. So I went back and checked everything again, eventually finding that the contacts on the on-off switch were dirty and had no continuity when closed. After that I applied about 5 volts, and this time the LED illuminated green. And better than that, pressing the shutter button fired the shutter and advanced the film. All good stuff. After firing the shutter a few times, I realised that if I held my finger on the button, the shutter would remain open. In other words, the camera was in bulb mode. Not the worst thing ever, because with a remote power pack and a switch for the shutter release, I could use the camera as a long exposure camera with no modifications at all. But I wanted to figure out a bit more about how the camera was supposed to work. There seemed to be quite a bit of electronics in there if all it did was open and close the shutter, leaving the rest of the control to the oscilloscope hood. I didn't expect anything fancy like variable speeds, because you'd only need one preset speed to capture the oscilloscope display. So I started probing the logic chips using my oscilloscope. I'd got the data sheets for the chips, so I had a vague idea what I might see. I was surprised, however, to find a very definitive signal one second after pressing and holding down the shutter button that looks like it should be doing something. If we look at this trace showing pins 3 and 6 on chip MC14023B, pin 3 is the yellow line, the initial dip happens when the shutter is pressed, then the voltage returns to 5 volts for one second before dropping to zero until I release the shutter button when it goes back to 5 volts, with a little jiggle as the motor advances the film. My initial theory is that the oscilloscope, or the attached hood, should close the contact to trigger the shutter, and the shutter should remain open for one second, while the actual photo is taken, before automatically closing again, at which point the brown wire would be grounded, presumably releasing the closed contact within the oscilloscope or hood. I carried on probing, and this NEC chip that I haven't found any data for is connected to a tantalum capacitor, which appears to be charged while the shutter button is pressed. When it gets to 4 volts, which takes 1 second, it outputs a signal that I'm guessing should trigger the second curtain to be released. If you look at this trace, the yellow trace shows the pin that's connected to the capacitor, and the blue trace shows the output when the capacitor reaches 4 volts. So I kind of think that either something has gone wrong on the PCB and it's not releasing the second curtain, or this particular camera had the feature disabled due to the particular configuration it was used for, or that someone has tampered with it in the past, or I'm completely mistaken. As it stands, I could just use the camera for long exposures, but it would be nice to understand a little bit more about it first. Potentially, if I'm right about the signal being the one that's supposed to close the second curtain, a somewhat crude adjustable shutter timer could be created by rerouting the supply for that capacitor to an array of capacitors, with some dip switches to select a speed. I really should pluck out the PCB and draw out the circuit diagram, which I might still do, but I'll go away for a few minutes to think about that first. OK, it's now a few days later, and I have some more thoughts. I suspect that the oscilloscope, or hood, might only send a brief pulse to trigger the shutter, and that the shutter should then latch open until the signal that we've already observed releases the second curtain one second later.
They might be using a flash sync contact that would be triggered when the first curtain is fully open. If that's the case, it's not unlikely that that contact is oxidised, as was the case with the on-off switch and the end of cycle switch connected to the brown wire. I also thought that the control circuit is pretty dumb, and keeping your finger on the shutter button will always keep the shutter open, so there's little point trying to substitute the delay capacitor with another value to get different shutter speeds, because anything faster than, say, quarter of a second would require you to remove your finger from the button unnaturally fast. So maybe I'll just keep the camera for long exposures, and simply make a power pack with a switch to ground the green wire that will act Act as a shutter button. After I'd filmed that last section, I did some more thinking and decided that I really did need to remove the circuit board and draw out the circuit diagram, which is what I did. It's not exactly a work of art, in fact it's fairly typical of my somewhat chaotic diagrams, but at least it's done now. I had hoped that with the ribbon cable desoldered from the board I'd be able to determine what each of the connections were doing without having to dismantle the rest of the camera, but that doesn't appear to be the case, and without that information the circuit diagram from the custom board isn't all that much help. I might carry on with the project at some point in the future, but for now I've run out of time and I really need to get on with other things, so I'll just reassemble the camera and put it to one side. I may well have a brainwave once I've stopped thinking about it, as is often the case, and that will rekindle my enthusiasm. So that's about it for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you don't miss out on the next thrilling episode of this project, whenever that is. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.